All right, so I'm recording and you can start at any time. Okay. Call this meeting to order. I still don't have a <laughs> uh, February 10th, 2021. So virtual um, gavel. Yeah, what's well, a Sharpie? <laughs> I mean, a, a highlighter. <laughs> <laughs> Got to improvise here. So if you want to look at the agenda, does anybody um, have anything they want to add or move or? I've got a couple of things. Yeah, I just want to make sure that people are able to find the agenda in the packet because normally we send out that email, it has an agenda on it, but it doesn't have the links to the packet. If you want to see the links in the packet, you've got to go to the city web page and go to the HTML version of the agenda in the packet. I always go to the HTML packet because it has the agenda in the front and you can click on the exhibits and it'll take you to that point in the packet okay just so you know i had no idea where to find it so yeah okay I, can i share <laughs> can i share screen and show you yeah or, yeah I, I might as well do that now how about that okay sure. um you're probably gonna have to share your screen so we can all see everything anyway uh yeah 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 okay so first things first Ah. Let's let all these programs open. Okay, so this is what the online agenda packet will look like when you bring it up. And it's a 51 page packet with the agenda at the beginning. Can everybody see that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and know. if. You're huh? Asking. I am not seeing it. I'm only seeing all of you. Let me see. Okay, there's Pete. Only Pete. Maybe I will. I need to click out some things. Gotta love technology. Yeah, no doubt. I'm going to start again then. References. Make sure I didn't do something on my end. There we go. I got it. For some reason it said dual screen monitor, but it didn't show up on the other screen. So, so you got it now? I do. Okay. Cool. Okay. So this is the this is where you want to get to. Now I'm going to show you how you get there. <laughs> Good. Uh, let me see. I will start Google Chrome and share my screen. Take you to the city homepage. Okay, you should see the city homepage. I do now, yep. All right, so there's several ways to get here. This is the homepage and in the upcoming events, you should see Natural Resources Committee. And it's supposed to be there. And if you click on that, it will take you to this page, which has an agenda and an HTML agenda and a packet and an HTML packet. Okay. That's one way to do it. The more surefire way to do things, and we back on the homepage here. There, um, there's you see under government it says public meetings. Yep. This is the link that I send out in the email. Got it. And this has okay. everything, all okay. the boards. And then, so you kind of have to find our meeting, which is here, NRC. And then under agenda, it's got a little PDF icon, an HTML icon. I don't really bother with that because the agenda is already in the packet. So I'll click on it, H, this one. And it's an HTML version. Perfect. Okay. Um, and it should have all of, all of these links should work if they don't. And you see a link that doesn't work, shoot me an email or something and I'll, I'll fix it. Okay. But this is a way to click through and it'll open up in a separate page, each of the exhibits. So yeah, I went looking for them and I couldn't find, I didn't ever okay. heard to go to the city website. That was too much sense. So yeah, 
And it might just be smarter and easier if I send you the entire packet ahead of the meeting. Yeah. Because that's what you would do with a hard copy. I think you've sent links to it in the past, or there have been yeah. agenda with links to it in the past. So. Okay. So, All right. So, okay. Housekeeping now, issue. <laughs> that's important. Yeah, it's a biggie. Yeah, yeah. it is. I pulled right. up the, the work part thing from the last time we talked about it. So, <laughs> and found that packet because I had it on my computer already. So, yeah. So is there anything else that yep. somebody wants to add from the agenda that we have? I have Well, I know we had talked add. about the heritage tree advocacy thing, and I was going to redo the agenda to talk about that in more detail, but um, I didn't have time. Yeah. Um, I want to add the annual report thing, too. And the so. annual report thing? Yeah. Okay. Because that's next week. I have to go in front of the city commission. and. Yeah. And thanks for sending me that video of the heritage I should you know, I should pull review that board out. guide giving his so like okay I kind of know what I'm doing now <laughs> oh yeah I didn't watch his presentation but it looked like pretty straightforward how long yeah. did he talk for he may have talked for two or three minutes yeah it was real short and then but then they asked him a bunch of questions yeah he had brought up some stuff and they asked questions so was he able to answer them yeah yeah oh, okay he well was. I so will like, assume now I gotta be on my toes if they <laughs> If they ask questions, um, you know, Laura would be there, Laura yeah. Kerway, yeah. Um, to so if it was you know, something I couldn't in answer I'm or sure something. She, I go, Laura, can you remember? Yeah. Yeah. And then there were a couple of emails, several emails from folks that I might not have been able to respond to last Friday, you know, last week, or so. I apologize for that. Um, but we can certainly bring those up during communications um, today. Okay. Where do you want to add the, the, the two items? The, uh, is that a new business or old business? <laughs> um, <laughs> communications, I'm not sure where that would actually fits in. Uh, well, I guess we put them under communications. Okay. Does that sound fun? Work I'm not sure they really need a lot of you know, consensus no, I just or anything. kind of, since I have to give the report for the group, it'd be good if the group glanced oh, in. First. Well, you, why don't you put that one under the, the uh, new business then? And okay. We, we can either do it before or after Heritage Tree nominations. Okay. Okay. It's up to y'all. Let's do it after Heritage Tree nominations because that's the most important thing, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is why I republished the agenda because I was like, oh my gosh, I'm behind. Um, yeah, let's jump onto that. Any any other comments about the agenda? Everybody looks good. Okay. Do we have any public people who are here who want to, other than Didi? We were gonna. No, doesn't look like we do. I don't see anybody waiting in the room in the waiting room. Um, I'm assuming Didi's just here for the heritage tree stuff. I think so. Them. I'll need. I'll need to unmute her. I shall lurk the meeting. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Should we get started on that? I'll give a brief intro. Oh, good. All right. Item one, new, disc new business, heritage trees. So um, am I still sharing my screen? No. Okay. Gosh. Uh, one sec. Packet. Oh, packet. Packet document. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, oh, wait a minute. Something didn't. Ha something did not happen right. <laughs> oh my goodness. I have my students think I'm just a retard sometimes <laughs> trying to share my screen. And I'm doing weird stuff. I used stuff. to be really good at this. <laughs> it's just an age thing. <laughs> um, okay. All right. There we go. All right. Share. 
Okay, so I've got the entire packet here. So okay. um, my little staff report at the beginning, which is basically what I'll be talking through. Not, not a lot, but uh, Didi, hi Didi, uh, <laughs> submitted two nominations in 2020. Uh, first is for Camper Down Elm, located on her property at uh, 415 Dewey Street. Second is for Camper Down Elm, located in the burial plot in Mountain View Cemetery. Um, and then Didi did submit a third nomination for a Camper Down Elm in the cemetery um, on the, in February. Um, and technically speaking, we're supposed to have all nominations in by you know, December 31st for that year, but we didn't get any other submittals this last year. So I don't have any objection to including the third tree. Uh, okay, no do you want me to update the materials? I'm actually doing two more Camper Downs next year too. So the uh, collection, all about 10 years apart from each other is kind of cool. Um, oh yeah. It's up to you. I mean, I have those, um, I can get that updated paperwork. All I really have to do is go to the aerial photo, ID exactly where it is, measure it as an overlay on the graded one where you have to ID where it is from the border. Other than that, I think uh, the cemetery can tell you the lot number. Yeah. Um, that's last time when I got, and you can do that by, well, and that's in the photo. Okay, um, well, we'll go through that. If you want that. to include it, fine. That would be awesome, possum, uh, because yeah, that's fine. two significant ones not very far apart from each other. I don't have an issue with it. I just want to make sure that when we go to the city commission, or I, I want to make sure that the NRC has enough information to act tonight. So, you know, verbally, mm -hmm. I think maybe you'll need to fill in some, maybe. Uh, I haven't had a real good chance to look at what you turned in, DD, on the third one. So. Yeah, and really what I don't have the, the capability of doing right now is going out and measuring it. Right. The right, diameter. Right. I think, actually, I think. Well, we might be able to figure actually, it I from the my, photo. My daughter-in-law go and hug it. <laughs> so I told him that was, but that's not official. That's not done with measuring tape. She can, she can do it within a few inches, right? Yeah, she did, she did it within six inches, and so I thought that was eight inches, and I called it six. So that's why it kind of came out oh, the, very close to the area. I know it's really kind of cute. I know what I am at 88 years old um, in, in oak language. It's kind of fun. <laughs> <laughs> choose, choose your tree. Find out your, your reach around. <laughs> well, okay. So now, um, since we have one on private property and two in the park, one on private property we'll talk through first and then we'll talk about the park ones but okay. they're all we can talk about them all i don't i don't mind um but for the benefit of the new members we'll just briefly run through the criteria so we have the heritage criteria and at least one of these must be met the tree must be associated with events that have made a significant contribution to the broad pattern of oregon city's history or this tree or stand of trees is associated with the life of a person or group of historic significance to the city, or this tree or stand represents a significant and distinguishable presence within the city, or the tree or stand has age, size, or species significance, either horticultural or ecological, which contributes to Oregon City's heritage status. So heritage tree criteria, at least one must be met, um, site and condition criteria all must be satisfied. Tree must not be listed as an invasive species on any regionally accepted plant list. And if it's on private property or if it's in the right of way abutting a private property owner who is responsible for it, then they must consent. Um, so, and if it's a city, sorry, if it's an agency other than the city, then we're required to get the consent of that agency or, or public, uh, public agency. Um, so those are the two site and condition criteria. Um, and the our options are to recommend approval of all the nominations as proposed, recommend approval of some of them, or, um, with, you know, some 
conditions if you wish, or don't recommend approval of any of them. Um, here's our code, chapter 12.32 heritage trees. Um, so in order to be eligible, um, we have listed certain species by size. And then this is an inclusive list. Any other deciduous tree species, I think we changed this, but it hasn't been updated on the website yet. 20 inches and any other coniferous trees or evergreen trees in 20 inches minimum. And then we have some de definitions in the chapter that you can take a look at sometime. And quite a process that we all worked on together to get to a point where it was reasonable. Um, so hopefully you've had a chance to look through the criteria and the code. Um, we now have uh, replacement requirements if a tree has to be removed that are specific to the size of the tree now. Um, and so, and also if it's a tree on private property, there's a legal requirement that there be a deed restriction recorded against the property that is a covenant. It's a, re a restrictive covenant um, that the owner must agree to sign. Yep. Um, and that kind of provides that status as a publicly recognized heritage tree. And essentially, even though it doesn't say this in the code, what that, what that means, I think, is that if somebody wants to remove the tree, it's been designated by the city commission as a heritage tree, and therefore really only the city commission can de-designate it or allow its removal. And, um, you know, so that means if you got to remove the tree and it's dangerous in the future, you've got an arborist report that says that, let's say, hypothetical case, um, you know, we would send that up to the city commission at a meeting and they would, uh, they would talk through it. And, okay, sorry, rambling. Okay. 415 Dewey Street, Camperdown Elm, 61 inches in diameter. Is that right? 17 feet tall, 16 feet spread. Um, so that might be a circumference. We got an arborist letter from Nick Bezerides. I've met him, but I'm not sure if that's how you say his name, but he did some, apparently did some treatments that have given the tree a jump start to renewed health. So that's good. And here's a little history of this unique species. Um, and with that, I'll hand it. Oh, and it's estimated that what? It's about 50 years old. So I'll, uh, I'll hand it over to Dee Dee and she can talk briefly about this one. Actually, I can, I can talk about this one and it will just completely relate to the two in the, the park. Um, the the uniqueness of these trees um and and i can't call out a year because i'm not looking at in front of it but I'm sorry I'll, it goes huh I'll, I'll pull i'll pull the photo up sorry oh they're, they're yeah. wonderful trees um you can actually see technically it's in a city street because i live in the old ely district if you go back one that is this is it during the summer or winter that's in spring it has a very unique flower and is green mm -hmm. and then it leaves out to a broad elm leaf this is not a grafted tree this was a mutant tree that was found in the forest off like earl camper i you know I'm, the story is now stretching but in in like <laughs> 18 something or other it's written in the little history um and he really found it unique, so he dug it up and put it on his estate. So he got to call it a camper down elm tree. Then he started propagating it. And this is it, how it will naturally grow. And they became very fashionable in Portland um, around the turn of the century, around 1900s. You, there's a beautiful example of one um, by that old Victorian house at the base of uh, Ross Island Bridge. 
F, mm. and that one is is about a little bit older, but I think it's 120 years old. But um, the reason I found out about this tree is that my my friend Barbara McNeely and I used to walk our babies up and round through, and I used to be able to take the dogs back in the day, up and round through that park um, or the the cemetery. And then when we were trying to hide from the kids, we'd go hide up underneath that camper down now because sometimes that grows all the way down to the ground. Later, it's where we'd go and smoke cigarettes when we didn't have the kids. <laughs> but anyway, Barbara and I both later bought camper down elms. Mine, I bought at a 25 year old one from a nursery that was relocating on McLaughlin Boulevard. So that's how I know how old my tree is because I planted it about 20, it's almost close to 30 years ago I planted it. So um, the others are basically dated by the latest, latest date on the headstones and that would just be an indicator. But okay. since um, they measure out like an elm, those indicators have kind of rung within 10%. So that makes it kind of fun. So well, let's look at those ones, shall we? Yeah, oh, they're okay. gorgeous trees. Real quick, I just have a, a question for yep. um, Nancy and um, anyone that might know on this. I've always been kind of curious with the moss growth that's on the trees. Does that, I mean, is that like a symbiotic type relationship? Is that, does that hurt the tree at all? Because I noticed it on, on, the, uh, on the tree there and I see it all, I mean, I see it on my trees too. And I've always wondered. Mike, you want to talk? You want me to? Uh, I think it's a Nancy question, but I've, but I either one of us at my so you tell it, Nancy. We're both botanists, but yeah, go for it, Nancy. It really <laughs> doesn't hurt the trees. It's not necessarily symbiotic. I mean, it's the same with lichens. You can have a tree completely covered with lichens, and it it doesn't hurt the tree. Um, some lichens are beneficial to the tree because some lichens, the the photosynthetic part is a, a cyanobacteria that fixes nitrogen, right? And that will add nitrogen to your soil, but not all lichens do that. And so, but, even but they're not- Even up in the branches? Huh? I said even it, when it's what up happens, in the branches? Yeah, what happens is they can be like, if, um, the best example is Loberia, which is this big leafy thing that you find on the forest floor in old growth forests. Um, and what happens is it, it's up in the top of the branches, but then it breaks off in a windstorm or something and it, it lands up on the ground and it dries up and then it ends up part of the soil and that's how the nitrogen gets added. Interesting. Um, and they actually estimate that most of the nitrogen in old growth forests comes from those lichens. Wow. That makes total sense. Wow. Okay, yeah. cool. Thanks guys. Yeah. That's really interesting. Yeah. The moth is also a sequester or absorb, you know, carbon and uh, add to you know, the storage capacity of trees and they need that all that surface area since, uh, you know, you can have more moss on 3D objects than you can on 2D, 2D surfaces. So yeah, good point. Contribute a lot. <laughs> and in early spring and late fall, you can see hundreds of bush tits going in, flying in and just pecking away at the little bugs. It's fantastic. I love that's the view out of my, um, Upstairs window. Nice. It's a good bird view. <laughs> cool. All right, let's go to the cemetery. So this one, the first one, 72 inch. I think that's a circumference measurement, right? Correct. Okay. 22 feet tall, 30 foot spread. And it's on the plot of the Karen Morey's letter here talks about the burial plot. Um, on lot 130, first edition of Mountain View Cemetery. And it's with the Clark and uh, Wheeler family. So um, anyway, estimated about 90 something years old, which kind of made sense. Um, could be 114 years old. Yeah, because they estimated it was early 1900s that it would have been planted. And here's the location on the OC map. And this is, this is it. Oh, nice. Isn't that a wower? 
It is. <laughs> that is a pretty tree. They so really funny to try. Nicely at the park. It will grow all the way down to the ground. It's just fantastic. That's a beautiful trim job. <laughs> so here's the headstone nearby. Clark, Joy, Sarah, and Alfred. This so they is are original pioneers out here. 1880, 1834 to 1934. Oh, the example of some of those trees down there are fantastic. Oh, family plot. Yeah, it's the Clark Joy. Clark Joy. Okay. Well, Nancy and, and Dee, I have a question. Are these elms susceptible to Dutch elm disease or are they different? No, they are not. And that oh. was very interesting is in the research, they, well, tell you what, during my Google research, they said, <laughs> and these are not. <laughs> so I, I, that is as good as the internet will tell me. So believe that as far as just what I Googled. Well, I assume the original pre-mutation version of this elm was a European elm. I would think so too. Yeah, which is different than the American elm. Yeah. I'm not even sure if they're the same genus, mm. but definitely different species. Yeah. Okay. And that's the second one. And then the third one, is this right? Yeah, okay, this guy, this one, okay. sorry. And if you can blow it up to see what the date is, you'll be able to almost gauge the date <laughs> on the tree. It's really hard to see. That is a cool looking tree. It is a cool looking <laughs> tree. <laughs> uh, I can't read that. Yeah, Let me try that's all right. It, it, it seemed to me it was about 81 years old. So yeah. I thought that was kind of interesting. And so... <laughs> But, but to, and and the two other that I discovered in Oregon City, and one I noticed when I went over to Byron Boyce's house, I said, you have a camper down elm? And he goes, yes, I planted that. Probably shouldn't have planted it right there. But anyway, so <laughs> then he didn't know about the ones in the cemetery, and he knows everything. <laughs> and um, then the woman on Warner Milne, Hers is a beautiful one. And she bought the house and the owner told her about the tree. And she's got the best history about her boys camping out underneath it. And that one is about 75 years old. So it's these really great examples all within a really quick area. We're going to get a walking tour and a bike tour and a driving tour of centurion ancient trees. I think it'd be great eventually to have, you know, we get a few more in our list. We have a tour yeah. where people can, yep. you know, even if they just walking around their neighborhood, they can go see what's in their neighborhood. Um, Absolutely. Really you know, wonderful. if you think about it, we're getting a fairly diverse one. Um, we're going to get a couple more parks online, hopefully Tyrone Woods and uh, Filbert. And those both have some beautiful examples of oaks and firs. Especially the one at Filbert Run. Man, that oak is monstrous. Um, and I'm so glad they're diverting the sidewalk. Um, and then, my goodness gracious, the, the burly centurion trees that are up in Atkinson Park. That's my... Dee Dee wants to learn how to do a inventory. <laughs> yeah, that, that's... A real live grown-up inventory. There. They took, there was a U in that park. There was a U in, in Atkinson There's Park. Still, there was. is the broken leftover stump. But there is still another little one there. Yeah, but um, that big Brian, one was just so impressive. And I went back I up know. and they'd cut it. And I was like, oh, I'm going to cry. I know I, well, you know what? <laughs> they just didn't know that all it needed was just a quarter inch to keep it alive. If you don't know, you don't know. And then everything mm -hmm. else thinks people's broken means it's ugly. No, yeah. no, 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 it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> means it's yeah. but that's what we can do in our tours when we're showing centurion trees you can start to show them they're getting their badges of honor look there's a hole in that oak and there's a squirrel living in there we have to get that squirrel out you know the, the gardener one. Oh my god that oak is fantastic and i got scolded by a squirrel going <laughs> looking in that hole <laughs> it's fantastic and um so that's a kid's project that we're trying to jump start over at Gardner School, but they're trying to get permission. 
to so we can get a tomograph on the tree and make it a whole kid science project. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going over the edge with this, you guys, but it's going to be a really good thing. It's so great. Okay. I mean, I just dig that you're cruising around the graveyard looking at these awesome trees. I mean, no, you're <laughs> that's how I got okay. there. <laughs> I used to make my kids clean the gravestones on Hall Halloween day so they could get candy at night. And one time we hit our neighbor in there and we rattled chains at them and they went, oh man, that's just Kenny Armstrong. <laughs> Didi, I love your style. Oh yeah. I love that place. Oh I, just, I just want her energy, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Ivy. Yeah. yeah it's, you coop me up. <laughs> I don't have strangers to attack. <laughs> You know, I have my own thoughts on these trees. Uh, this is just personal experience, but every Camperdown elm I've ever seen has been crafted on a different rootstock. So uh, I'm wondering if it's worth pointing out with these specimens that they were all grown from seed, you know? Mm. You know if that's worth, you know, well, making- You know who would know and be able to ID that? Well, actually, <laughs> you have a botanist and tree experts on your board, there but you that was yeah. something that, Brian Boyce pointed out to me, which I didn't mm -hmm. realize. But then I thought these were all grafted when I first saw them. And then I did the re research and I went, oh, that's yeah. why he told me mine was so unique. So I thought, oh, mm -hmm. so all right. I mean, I, it took special. me years to put the connection together. Mm -hmm. Makes yeah. me more special. Change it doesn't change the uniqueness bird, for bird sure. in it too. <laughs> I had dug it out. The fact that their trunks are so flared, you know, it's mm -hmm. solid and then flared, and then it becomes these crazy yeah. Yeah. branches. Yeah. Awesome trees. Looks like it might, you a know, a vase of flowers. That's how you're supposed to, you're supposed <laughs> to uh, um, describe elms as a beautiful vase of flowers. These are like little pygmy flowers, they're like a little bouquet. You know, they're just fantastic. I just love them. And and then you get up and you just see all this life growing on and all these wiggly limbs. It's just crazy. I love them. All right. Does so anybody, what's our next move, Pete? Do we? Um, you can take a consensus vote or we can call a vote about whether they meet the criteria that's relevant or you can um we want to basically take the ones that are in the park to the prac as well as soon as possible right um so should we do the one on dd's property first yeah sure let me scroll back to that one oh. i have a question about um, signage yeah so city um, provides how... plaques they're just a, uh, we get them down at Canby Trophy. It's like about this big. Um, they cost about $45 for the plaque. City pays for that. Um, and, you know, depending on what the owner wants to do with the plaque, we'll either, you know, normally it's just the plaque. We used to put them on a stand, but, you know, if you put them in the ground, somebody might take it away. So we just furnished the plaque now and it has a common name, scientific name, the year it was uh, nominated and designated and the age estimate. Um, I think that's it. And if there, there are, you know, if once in a while somebody have a special request for an inscription on the, on the plaque, which we can accommodate um, but you know, that's the way we do it now. You know, I'm open to suggestions on interpretive signage and that sort of thing. Currently, we don't really get into that. We just furnish this very simple, basic plaque. It seems like that would be hard to maintain on private property. Mm -hmm. Hey, I, I have an idea or kind of a question here, guys, you know, how in the like McLaughlin district, how all of the historic houses have uh, they've got their little signs, plaques, similar to like a tree or whatever, and then they've got their own unique web page. Is there any sort of like rollout for historic Oregon City trees where they've got like, because what Didi was saying was fascinating to me about the history of these trees. Like, is there any capture on that anywhere? 
It's no, but basic. we have a title and it's, it's called "If This mm-hmm. Tree Could Talk." Well, we are on the website, but you know, it's not a very elaborate website on the city website. So okay. Because it would be cool if the trees had an identity and tying this in with the placards and our limited funding and trying to get more trees nominated, raise nominated, raise awareness and also grab funding to get more plaques and stuff like that made. It would be kind of cool if there was an easy place where you could go and you could see the history of the trees. It could be educational and it would, I don't know, maybe drive a little bit more community involvement and in getting their trees on their mm-hmm. own properties. Nominated. No, I agree. And then, you know, maybe have it tied into the, um, mapping system the map program as well or at least mm-hmm. have some sort of a map our yeah, gis staff are really good so i think you could do a walking tour and listen to the history of the treaty on your phone as you went by and mm-hmm. and actually we um i've been talking with melody at the willamette view she wants to do an interview where children interview the expert and they talk about the tree it's uniqueness and then if the owner is there and they have a like unique history maybe that that could go in there and you could either watch it all the time or go fill the whole thing or skip and just listen to what you want yeah. and so i have a, another question about the signs so is it then the private owner's responsibility for posting the signage um how does that happen i guess yeah, it's pretty much up to them. The city doesn't really, you know, at, at the point at which we hand it off to the owner is once, once we've recorded the covenant and given them a copy of their certificate, which we provide a little certificate and, uh, and the plaque. So beyond that, I currently don't do much more than that. But, um, you know, if you guys have other ideas on how to are there any, um, is there any cases where the owner did not post the plaque, but was given a plaque? Um, well, they've all been given plaques and that's, I don't know if they, I don't follow up to check whether they post them or not. So the one, the yeah. one at Pleasant View, or, um, at the, at the Veterans Be Good oak tree there on the corner off Malala, the Clackamas water and soil, they lost theirs. So that their their signs kind of been just lost mm-hmm. in process of moving. And it was a field and that, you know, they were afraid it would just get mowed over in the field when it was raised at that one time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The one at the uh, the Ponderosa Pine over there at the Ainsworth house, they mounted it on a big stone that was at the base of the tree that already had a history on the tree. So they kind of added it to that. Ron Tom's um, mm. big leaf maple that blew down. He still has his theirs up anyway. <laughs> <laughs> They're just thinking about what tree to plant. <laughs> yeah. So well, yeah, I think. It doesn't sound like there's a concern about plaques not getting posted if they're provided by the city. I was just wondering if there was any follow-up so that, you know, if we're investing in their tree and giving them a plaque, it'd be nice just to know it gets posted eventually. (laughs) So they're not just hanging out on someone's shelf. Yeah, I I don't disagree. I mean, there's, you're, you know, this is a public process and it's public Mm -hmm. recognition. So there ought to be some sort of a Mm, I don't know commitment actually I don't because see some some are going to probably be in some areas in private backyards the grand fur that Doug um, nominated that's on 12th street yeah that's in in the backyard you wouldn't necessarily walk into that backyard and go in right. and it's look visible at it. I, but, I viewed it from yeah. the street when I yeah looked at it. yeah so I mm-hmm. I think it's this is kind of like their badge of honor. I'll leave, put yeah. mine out there, but it's more like a badge of honor. Um, well, I could speak as a McLaughlin historical district resident that um, we're very good about um, just maintaining the historical integrity of our designated properties. You know, there's a good culture of that. So it would be great if we could tie in, you know, the trees themselves as landscape features into the historic property. Um, You know, because we already have this great kind of informal system of oversight that we maintain pretty well. 
you know, and, and on that note, the historic inventory that we did in 87 only ever covered architectural features. Like the only landscape feature that was included was the, um, the promenade. Mm -hmm. um, I had can't... the same question several years back, when, you know, and I approached the preservation staff, which is Christina yeah. and, uh, and Kelly, um, you know, and the, the, the inventories that they have done in the past have, you know, had a little sentence on there for landscaping and they, but it's only like very general. Sometimes there's no map or anything of the vegetation. Yeah. And I think that question really ought to be discussed with the HRB. Yeah. Because when they come back around and do the 25 year inventories, you know, because everything's getting older. <laughs> so mm -hmm. suddenly a mid-century modern becomes a historical type of architecture or something like that, right? Um, then they could decide, you know, whether how closely they want to pay attention to the landscaping because it's a dynamic part of the property and the landmark. And I've been told many years back that, you know, they had kind of refrained from looking at anything but the structure but, uh, you know, I don't know that that's the case anymore. I would just want to get a little more background on that approach from with input from the HRB and the staff. Mm -hmm. you know? I think especially trees would be important to add to that because, you know, gardens change and people decide to make a rose garden or something else. And, and gardens change pretty fast, actually, in, in a lot of sure. cases. But yeah. Trees, big trees tend to stay where they are unless they fall down or get diseased. So right. and we do, and we did have a, an effort and have, and I still have the list. I use it to contact private people that, oh, I'm such a, I, a Jessica, uh, a Francesca and, mm -hmm. um, yeah. oh, shucks. Anyway, of, of significant trees in the McLaughlin. I know the lady walked by my house like a month ago and I talked to her about it, so. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah, so there you go. And I, I have that. that. <laughs> yeah, we got to keep that inventory because yeah. if we can start with a little movement down in competition between neighborhoods, um, Berkeley Hills right now is leading. <laughs> Chris, these two women probably, I don't know how many years ago, but they were at one of the meetings when I first started. So probably four or five years ago. I can't remember when I started on this. Yeah. 2011, but, I think was when we Pam, were. Pam, uh, Pam uh, is, Duggar is still living here. Um, yeah. I want to do but Barkley they Hills. And they made a list. They, they noted all the big trees in the McLaughlin neighborhood. That sounds about right. I, yeah. I was actually next door neighbors with Francesca Anton and, okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That 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 fits her mo. <laughs> I've got that list <laughs> somewhere scanned in. I, yeah. I have it. Yeah. Yep. That's fantastic. The other lady was going to prop it off, and I haven't seen her again. Pam, so. I gave Pam a new copy because she lost okay. one. I she said, was, "Okay, don't you get my copy, copy and give it to me?" But so uh, I I can do that. Actually, I can okay. probably photograph it and send it to you too. Um, they <laughs> categorize it two different ways. Um, but you know. But Barkley Hills, uh, Barkley Park, it's so cool. Pam Duggar asked like 35, 40 years ago if she could plant a few trees in that park. And that's where those firs came from, Pam Duggar. That's when you could go plant a tree in a park if you went and asked. <laughs> well, let's get back to these trees. Um, okay, I'm gone. I'm sorry. That's Mark. okay. No, no, this has been great. <laughs> But we probably should do the rest of the meeting. So um, let's look at Dee Dee's tree first. So should we just go back? Does everybody want to vote on it individually? Does anybody think it shouldn't be a heritage tree? That might be easier than going down the list. I'm I not say, sure. I can I can say all in all uh, in support of designation. Say I all say I. How about that? I could try that. I. Aye. 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 them all together or just each one? Let's do them separately. Okay. Uh, okay. All opposed for Dee Dee's tree? Not hearing a nay. 
All right. Next. The other. What's that? The other two? Yeah. Very true. Yeah. It's uh, Camperdown, Elm, Clark Joy plot, Mountain View Cemetery. Yeah. All in support. Say aye. 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 And the Camperdown Elm on the other plot. Sorry, what is that? The Penman plot? Penman plot. All in support of this one. Say aye. 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 Hopefully it won't walk away one day. <laughs> <laughs> looks like it could. It, yeah. it looks like it's right out of the Lord of the Rings. You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. I'm not going to show you what a big Tolkien geek I am, but mm home. That's what they said. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's what tree bead said. Tree beard. <laughs> tree beard. <laughs> I should have worn my tree beard shirt. I have a tree beard shirt, you know. <laughs> awesome. Okay. I'm at this. Yeah. All right. Okay. So, so that makes five trees for Mountain View. Mountain View. Uh, right. Three, four, uh, six, right? Because of no, the three, three, three sequoias. Oh, and two, the two camper downs. downs. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yay. Cool. And cool. so, okay. Well, I'll just keep quiet and just lurk for the rest of the meeting. Yep. Thank you. So, all. yeah. Thank you, right. Well, the two in the cemetery now go to Prac, right? The two sequoias in the cemetery. Oh, you the camper downs? Yeah, the camper downs. Yes. So this was the Prac to look at now. Yes. Okay, cool. Which is the last Thursday of every month. So, be February 25th for Prac. Okay. which is good it gives us a little time um okay so that's new business and so we were going to talk in new business about annual report. annual report shall i i'll pull up the annual report yeah and we just need to look at that first page with the summary stuff all right of course now i put it somewhere silly You just sent it to me. <laughs> I did. I, I know. It. I was like, it was in my email. I, lost so. it. I have no idea. I never delete anything and it's gone. <laughs> um, all right. Hang on. Bear with me. Annual report. Oh, come on. No, that's from me. But what time did I send that to you? Oh, there it is. Sorry, I should have had this up. All right. Share again. Oh, Linda's here. Yep. She wanted to listen in. Hi, Linda. Hi, Linda. Uh, Okay, so everybody see the NRC 2020 review document. Okay. Um, let me go for. Under the accomplishments list, it says we added four motivated and very qualified new members, and I already figured it's... out we added three. So. <laughs> Sorry. We... Okay. <laughs> three. Maybe. One of us isn't motivated. One of them isn't motivated. <laughs> yeah. Who's not motivated? <laughs> they aren't going to raise their hand. <laughs> Despite the impacts to all of our daily lives and schedules from coronavirus, NRC remained a committed and productive committee in 2020. Nancy, do you want to run through this or as a practice? Oh. Or yeah. <laughs> we added three new <laughs> qualified members. Um, thank we we give thanks to Doug Neely yeah, for right. his long service to the city and the Natural Resources Committee. Um, yeah, I can't imagine without I, I'm still having tribal trouble dealing with this committee without him being on it, to be honest. So, you know, I know we need to move on, but wow. 
What a what a tremendous asset to Oregon City. Is he going to continue being John McLaughlin? Oh, I think so. I don't know. <laughs> I would. He's been John McLaughlin for so long. <laughs> How do you stop? Um, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, jointly, we continue to work together to improve communications between staff, PRAC, the public, including applicants for development approval, and the NRC. Um, NRC provided, provided important input on several amendments to the following chapters of the Oregon City Municipal Code, which were started in 2018 and adopted in January 2020. Um, I'm not going to read the numbers, but public and street trees, heritage trees and stands, public improvement standards, Willamette River Greenway Overlay District and Natural Resources Overlay District discussed and provided input on the tree removal policy on city owned lands at five meetings in 2020, Forest Edge Apartments Stabilization application, uh, Tree City USA application, which we got, uh, three applications for private heritage tree nominations, two applications for public heritage tree nominations, input on updating the Geologic Hazard Code as per state requirements. Um, partnerships provided support and feedback for several projects, including the Greater Oregon City Watershed Council projects, Thimble Creek property owners and Thimble Creek Heritage Tree Process, and support for technical assistance grant for comprehensive plan update. And the last one, I have no idea what that means. And so I don't know that we need to go through yeah, no. each of the agenda items, but- No, we don't. I just list them so that it's, you reminded so of things that, that we heck discussed. I what we did. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So pretty good year and all in spite of COVID, I would say. Um, and there's a lot coming up. Um, so yeah. Um, didn't really talk about, you know, what's coming up in the future because I haven't gotten much feedback. I don't know what was discussed and there's no summary yet provided for the uh, city commission retreat. Um, but did we propose, is that where we made the proposal for a inventory? Yes. Yeah. So, if somebody asked me what we want to do in the future, I'm going to say we're advocating for a, a tree inventory, city tree inventory, at least right. you know, street trees and trees and parks and stuff. Yep. Yeah. So I've, I've floated that question to the management and um, I expect an answer soon. So, okay. Cause it'll well, be here before next week. Let me know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so yeah I no, say, I, I would nice like, to know before you present for sure. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, so if anybody wants to see, all, you know, all of this stuff, I save it. Um, and okay. this is just skipping over the top. You know, there's a lot more information about each of your agenda items that is in the, in the record. Yeah, it's nice to have that brief <clears throat> overview of what we did at each meeting. So yeah. if I, I ever miss anything, you know, that I was mentioning in, in an email that, you know, I always I'm going to push for and I'm going to advocate that, you know, NRC have a secretary, if only to keep me in line to make sure I don't forget anything either for you know, record keeping purposes or for a future agenda item. But we don't have to tackle that question right away. I just want to put that out. If anybody has a dying urge to become the secretary. <laughs> you don't actually have to take minutes. It's more of a, you know, make sure we don't drop the ball on anything. Yeah. That might help us actually approve the minutes once in a while too. We have a bad tendency. I don't know how many months or years we're behind on minutes. So. <laughs> oh, you're muted. You're muted, Pete. My button off. Okay, how's that? Okay. You're back. Yeah, that's much better. Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> we have a transcriptionist, so minutes aren't an issue, you know. But if you ever see minutes that are wrong or need correcting, you're welcome to do that. So, and we haven't seen any draft minutes in quite some time. So I need to check to see what's going on. It could be a COVID yeah. thing. I know we were gonna approve minutes a couple of meetings ago and then we were all like overwhelmed. And so we said, we'll do it later. <laughs> oh, did we table some that we should have? Yeah, we uh, tabled a bunch from two meetings ago. 
Oh, I can't remember. Whoops. Okay. We don't want to look at those tonight, though. <laughs> no. Um, okay. So, okay. does anybody see anything they want to add to that lovely annual review? Yeah, good question. I think, yeah, most there's, well, three of you were here before. <laughs> We're just going to do our best to forget 2020. <laughs> I have a question. <laughs> um, sure. There was a tour done or a field check done. Is that true? Field a check. A site visit? Well, there was the Thimble Creek yeah, site the Thimble visit. Thimble Creek. Which yeah. are still going on, right? I mean, I, I, I think we need to have a discussion during communications about where we, right. you know, who, who we're looking for direction from next on that. Right. Yeah, three, there were three different site visits. Several members went out. I think we went out in two spurts um, mm -hmm. because they didn't want, they don't want more members. You, you can't have a quorum when you go out there. So only a few people can go at a time. But that one day we had two different groups go out and just do a general tour. And then um, I went out with Trevor. Is that his name? I'm so bad with names. I have Trent. too many students. Trent, that's it. See, it's a TR. I'm like, there's too many. So Trent and I went out um, and looked at the property where the spring was and looked at some trees out there and did some measurements because they were interested in, in nominating some of their trees for heritage trees. And so I talked to them and we did some DBH measurements and stuff. Um, and then Mike and I went out to the golf course in January and um, made a bunch of nominations about like a heritage grove along the edge of the ridge there with the woman who owns that. But, you know. Yeah, so there's some concrete steps that we probably need to take, like map, map the ones that they do want and decide yeah. when they want to do it. It was kind of in their court to, they were talking to developers Mm -hmm. that there are four different developers that potentially could buy the place and you know they wanted to get their buy-in on going forward i mean it made a lot of sense to do it because of the potential of set asides and exchanges and such and so um yeah and i i don't know how do you remember nancy whether she said there was a timeline for get you know I don't remember her saying a timeline, but I know there was, she had talked to several developers and there was one in particular that she said she would run the idea of having heritage trees right, right. Um, on the edge of that ridge with, and so, but I, mm -hmm. you know, haven't heard anything back since. And I haven't heard anything back from the people with the spring either. So maybe we need to have some, but maybe have Laura reach out to them and see if they've had any decisions i mean mike and i both said we'd come back out we had a great time running around out there right and <laughs> yeah um actually i will follow up with the property owners and see what okay. they want to do okay. because um you know to they can start the process anytime they want right um yeah okay I don't think she wanted to encumber the property with a decision that might, you know, disenfranchise the, the, potential, the develop, potential developer yeah. Yeah. or buyer. Yeah. And that might be what the other people are thinking too. So, well, I get it. Yeah. yeah. So they may but not, still would be good to stay may not respond too much, Pete, to prodding or at least, but you never know. It doesn't hurt to ask. Yeah. No, I mean, it's a good you point. You could offer us, you know, that we'd be willing to come back out again too if yeah. we really weren't interested in doing that. So, yeah. sure. Yeah. Okay. It's if always good offering. to keep oh, the lines of communication you know. open. Yeah. Yeah. That's, mm -hmm. I think, important. All right. Okay. So, we're on to old business. So, we're going to everyone's favorite thing work plan. <laughs> that's nobody's favorite. <laughs> All I know is when we finished the heritage tree code and we could cross that off, that felt better than anything. <laughs> no, it did. Well, the only concrete thing that's come up that we really need to be discussing in terms of addition to the work plan is um, our desire to 
do a citywide tree inventory, um, which could take a significant amount of, of time, both on the committee's part as well as, uh, as staff. So, you know, I think it, it, it definitely mer merits being on a top of the list or somewhere at the top of the list. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's essentially a, it'll take the form of a inventory of some sort. Um, so it could potentially be adopted as part of the comprehensive plan, which we're starting, we're in the middle of it. Well, not in the middle, we're about a, a quarter of the way into the comp plan process. So, um, yeah, I would put it under NRC responsibility two on the first yeah, page. Plan up, I, we can't see it. Oh, I mean, sorry. I <laughs> need to share. Just yeah, I know, share. I'm not sharing. <laughs> um, all right, spreadsheets. All right, activity worksheet to inform the work plan. So this is actually a worksheet, but you know, um, we've got responsibility one, promoting community involvement, in natural resources, conservation, citywide tree inventory with volunteers would certainly do mm -hmm. that. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Um, and then- It'd be volunteer, you know, based. Okay. You have a volunteer here, and I think I can get two more. I'm going to sign off and go to the mayoral debate. See you all oh, later. That's up. Bye, Dee Dee. But you guys know that you have a volunteer here. I know now, that, Dee Dee. We'll start. <laughs> we'll see. Bye bye. Thank you, Dee. Okay. Is, is this a good spot for it, or are there other places that got to go? It's not really important. I think maybe this is on the first page, so it's probably a good yeah. spot for it. Yeah. Are you putting it under the second one or the first one? Well, the second one is, oh, right. Uh, yeah, community strength and one. courage participation. I would put, I would bump down number one and put yeah. number one below number two. And then, I don't know. What do you guys think? Yeah, I think the inventory should be bumped up to the top. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And while we're doing the inventory, we can promote the heritage trees that are out there. So, <laughs> so what do we want to say? Um, uh, support the wide street. Now, this is a. Are we being specific about street trees? Yeah, or. I mean, it'd be nice ultimately to have a free inventory of the entire city, mm -hmm. but I think- Well, you could just say public tree. Yeah. So yeah. In, a, in essence, it could include schools. Right, and parks yeah. and, and parks trees and- And other, you know, municipal properties. Um, so like city hall, for example. Okay. Right. Hey. Just be street tree. And, add, and street trees and so yeah and we don't just want to do street trees we want to do more than that but we're not ready to go in people's yards cool <laughs> we don't have a code for that properties. right yeah there's no point in doing that um okay so let's see sort of public properties i want to mm -hmm. say uh school properties street trees sorry and is the yeah. OC library a city property or is that like a is that a park public, library district public lands yeah um it's park in the library a park library is a city-owned park yeah carnegie park because i'm thinking park? The metro property library park. Um, pretty much fall in under other public lands i think yeah, because we have metro properties, county properties. Yep. Um, we do have a few weird little state-owned properties that are oddballs, like the armory. But I think the armory sold. Mm -hmm. 
And then there's some state lands that are owned by Department of State Lands, not by Oregon Department of Transportation, but public lands, you know, I think we're going to run into trouble trying to designate. No, maybe not. I don't know if ODOT has ever been open to people running tree inventories on their property, but at the same time, there's no, no harm in doing an inventory. I mean, if we're looking at the potential to take carbon up for climate change type things, then we need to do the, those trees as well. So, you know. So I'd like to down. include a little more description here with respect to this being a volunteer project. Uh, volunteer participation in. Remote. Remote. <laughs> he types like I do. I do. Sam, what's a good way to say that? You've done these before. <laughs> I know. Support and promote uh, volunteer participation. Partis participation for a public tree. There we go. Yeah. yeah. That works. And have we designated the program that we're going to do to inventory these trees? Like, are we using, I think, Sam, you talked about there was an iPhone program or like an Esri suite or ArcGIS where we could easily do this in the field? I don't think we've even started that discussion as to what specific we're going to use. I know there's a bunch of them, but okay. mm -hmm. it should be something we should talk about at some point. Yeah, I think once we or once we know whether we've got city commission report support for right. it um that's important because that means that there may be some department administrative support and money available mm -hmm. um, um which is a, which is there big. Were grants available too so um you know. yeah there's a lot of options available but it's kind of a it's too immature to talk about it at this point since we mm -hmm. don't have support from the city right to do it right mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. All right. And I'm just curious, what's the ideal timeline for this? Yeah. Um, I, I imagine that we can't get this going until late spring uh, because IDing will be so much easier then. Is, is that real? You can do it whenever. You just need the right people to know what they're looking for. I yeah. took my tree ID class in winter in Michigan. Mm. No right. leaves, no flower. You can <laughs> I do it. Spending... But if we're relying on volunteers, then yeah. you know, it's, it's just hard. easier when you have some sort of foliage to identify it by. You're right. right. And it's a lot more comfortable to do it in warmer weather. Right. Yeah. True. So I agree yeah. with you, but I'm just saying like, you don't need a leaf if you're yeah. sappy enough. Um, I'm, not I, I was, enough. Um, I'm still I'm down in Cozine Creek trying to figure out oaks and ashes mm -hmm. and I'm like, Right. We that's for sure an oak and that's for that. sure an ash and I'm not sure what that tree is so <laughs> well plus we got google street view and various other things and we can extrapolate potentially. real quick though so uh you mentioned that there was some sort of tree identification course do we have like a, a resource that we can tie so if someone wants to do inventory we can say oh hey you can take x amount of time and maybe there's like a youtube video or, or something like that just to improve efficacy of the survey so the way that when I did it, they had volunteers go around and then they had a quick QA, QC crew that would just kind of drive around and review all the trees that the volunteers monitored and they'd be able to see the list of trees that they collected. And then they could like, just from the, tr from the truck, they could be like, yeah, that's right, that's right, that's wrong, that's wrong. And you know, they could, you know, QC quality control everything um, on, in the truck. So there's a way to, you're right, quality control and quality assurance is important as a part of this inventory. Um, but yeah, that's all details to be discussed yeah. at a later date. Yeah. I mean, I'm really great with native plants and you put all these horticultural things and it's like, <laughs> so well, you know, I'm I connected with folks that, that are happy to lead courses and um, provide uh, educational assistance um, when we're ready for it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. So the other things that are on the list that all sound 
like ongoing work. Um, our partnerships with OWEB, partnerships with Greater Oregon City Watershed Council. Uh, Doug Neely had brought up number eight here, one of the last meetings, because that's actually an, a, a plan in place mm -hmm. right now. Um, and they, it's not in place, sorry. Let me retract that. It is being reviewed by OWEB. Uh, and we sent in some support letters for the, for the plan for uh, Newell Creek to Abernethy Creek. Um, actually, a lot of the sites that they've identified in that plan are not within the city limit, they're upstream, um, but just as important because they flow through the city and we're part of the, of the greater watershed. Right. Uh, let's see. Uh, the city commission is actively discussing the idea of um, potentially doing habitat improvement projects within the cove. Um, so we should probably keep that one in there. Uh, number five, which is supporting a process for naming and signage of local natural and geological features for improved awareness of watersheds and enhanced tourism. This one is a nice idea. I'm not sure how it really plays out in terms of um, a process. Um, it's, uh, you know, a lot of us have local names for some of our creeks and even some of our parks, like Waterboard Park is not an officially named park that way, you know, things like that. Um, so I can't see, and there's no state process for naming. There's a federal process for naming, but it seems to be something controlled by a very kind of obscure agency, which I don't know is around anymore. So, yeah. I'm wondering if we can't coordinate with the HRB on this point and just have uh, individual features, you know, wherever it's eligible to be included with um, the historic properties. That's a great idea. Mm -hmm. One perspective I have reading this sounds like it's calling for um, educational signage in yeah, public areas. That's, that's that what essentially I think like? what it's going for is interpretation yeah. and it doesn't really. Because it might be good to say like what would this look like and if it's if it includes interpretive signage you could say interpretive signage because that way people understand exactly what this is asking yeah. for. Um, it could be something else beyond that. Like it could be a an audio tour, much like the historical houses have. It could be mm -hmm. a website with interpretive, you know, an interpretive or interactive website. Um, so, it, but I think uh, interpretive signage would be like a, you know, kind of a one of many options or forms that this could come in. But I think it would be good to just kind of list what we're thinking of when we're describing, you know, local natural geological features for improved awareness. Well, signage is one way. Mm -hmm. even, even, you know, a paper, either map or pamphlet or booklet or something, you know, that could be developed that at least identifies the list of all these that are known would be really useful. There's a um, lot of old brochures that we have yeah. um, that do exactly that. You've got the historic walking tour. There's, there's several, but um, I'd have to, yeah, you're right. This would be probably through the HRB and through some of that. To prove, yeah. And if you had something, so it was, on the web so you know like again you could access it with your phone and you could walk around and push a number in and it would tell you all about that property or that geologic feature or that tree or something mm -hmm. um, that would be a real boon for tourists when they're uh, walking around and looking at things media to... and it could even resolve or turn into like a you know when we can be physically social again in person like 
much like we have tours in different areas of the city, it could be, you know, a natural features type tour, if that makes any sense. I mean, I'd be totally down for that, but we have historical tours, we have, um, you know, uh, other, and we have tours at the cemetery. Um, it could be other geological features That's a good within idea. the city. Yeah. So it doesn't just have to be, right. you know, a static sign or an interactive website or, you know, something like that. It could just be a little bit more interactive and engaging where people are actually going out. They have an interpreter, you know, guiding a tour of some sort. So, and it could be video videos. Somebody makes a video of all these things and has it available for um, access whenever. Well, as an academic, it sounds like a great project for, you know, like a master's level or, you know, yes. somebody senior project in environmental education. Um, yeah, I was thinking it'd be a great opportunity for students. Yeah, okay. absolutely. It would be a great opportunity for a landscape architecture studio for a full term. Right. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I can okay. think of some good people that would want to leave that. Cool. Yeah. So all you need is money, Pete, and you can just get <laughs> just it as, money like, as a grant or you know some sort of an incentive to uh, have people pull together and do it. I like this one. I'm not sure if it's entirely doable between 2021 and 2023. Yeah. Um, but you know, it's it's something we should probably. It's an ongoing project. Yeah. But well, we could kind of flesh it out more. It's a little, you know, uh, vague at this state, but if we mm -hmm. had it on the agenda as a working item, we yeah. could discuss but it I more about what we want it to sense. be. And this then kind of from what we've had on here for a long time. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. So we can move the needle a little bit. Local <laughs> natural features, plural, for improved awareness of watersheds. Well, he just doubled the number of words describing it. So that's a, <laughs> an enhancement. Uh, yeah, I'm being redundant here. I'm good at that. <laughs> Etc. Uh, support for what? Okay, it's a draft. Yeah, <laughs> it's good. It's got the ideas down there. All right. Number four is a head scratcher. It's tied to a bunch of older plans, which are still good ideas. It's just that we are physically and isolated by highways from getting to the river. And there's a, there's a lot of discussion and good ideas in those plans. So the waterfront master plan, downtown community plan, and the comp plan about improving connections to the Clackamas River and the Willamette River. And a lot of that discussion has been related to redevelopment of properties like the landfill and the end of the Oregon Trail and, uh, and so, you know, I think that there's a desire to do that, but there's some very big barriers, not just physical in the way of highways, but also bureaucratic in the way of ODOT and flood control agencies and various other things, because a big chunk of that area is also in the floodplain. So anyway, I think it's, it merits to stay on the list because it, it's a, it's a it's kind of a it ties back to a lot of really good plans that still have validity and do we so, want to move it lower on the list instead of up this high because it seems like it's of less importance than some of the other stuff we're doing sounds it almost really seems like we should maybe look at rearranging these because I mean yeah. continue to work with the, the property owners on the heritage tree for Thimble Creek we're doing that so that it seems like stuff we're actively doing now should be higher or stuff we're actively we really want to get this done now like this in inventory and then maybe some of the other things that we don't know how we're going to do I mean I th think that's a great idea with all that connectivity stuff um, and it could just be walking trails a, but still a question about the connectivity item this one i don't know much about it'd be good to know um if there's been any work done on this at any level um and how much and what are some of the proposed options um 
and what that looks like and also kind of see if there's any changes that you know new opportunities might have cropped up since mm -hmm. the plan was developed so it might just need a little refresher mm -hmm. uh, but i honestly don't know a whole lot about it so i could use some education myself yeah Wasn't i think it's one of doug's things it was doug's thing uh, we but I, ask Doug if he wants to come back and give a report to the committee. <laughs> sure. Um, I think it's tied to the trail parks and rec trails master plan update, uh, which parks and rec wants to do and needs funding to do. Uh, it's also tied to development projects like along the cove because um, they're required to continue the Clackamas River Trail and connections. 299E and Clackamas Park, et cetera, et cetera, as conditions of their development approval. So does this now tie in? That kind of thing the, is codified. Does it tie into what's going on at the old mill property? Um, uh, yeah, mill, so, I think but, so. I mean, it's tied to yeah, the Willamette the Falls too. Legacy Project because of the river walk. So, um, yeah, I think it, uh, it's something that as we go through the comprehensive plan update, we want to make sure that it's that the uh, implementation actions are more concrete, you know, and then based on what we currently know about development and when and how quickly it's happening. But it's, it's an ongoing thing. Yeah, well, Emma Falls, you know, with the Grand Ronde wanting to look at new concepts. I mean, they still, they, they still support the idea of public, uh, you know, access to the river along the edge of the property, not so much through the middle anymore, but um, yeah. So that's I'd be something interested that's part of that got approved. to learn more about this project and see where it's at and if there's any updates um, and also to know what the needs are, like what kind of support or you know, if they need access needs um, and where where the NRC can fit in to support it. Right. Yeah. Um, so much of this is, you know, tied to agreements with private property owners. You know, we can't get it without private property consent. So, um, but yeah, okay. Move it around a little bit. Okay, I think we're done with this one. Number two, update the citywide water resource and wetland inventory. Um, this is a discussion item that was in the last city commission goals and priorities, and I'd like interested to see where they think they're going to fall with the latest biennial goal. Mm -hmm. you know because this was something that would require a couple of hundred thousand dollars to do if not more um we have to hire a consultant and get landowner consent and various other things so then it's, it's a major one so it's really dependent on funding yeah um Number two, I'm not sure this is a good spot for it, but anyway, it's here. Uh, support a coordinated strategy for invasive species management in 20. <laughs> Been on here for a while. Yeah. <laughs> Anything to me? Such as encouraging city participation in the Clackamas County IPM program and improve public outreach and information about invasive plants. We have a, oh, that's something that we need to do is we need to update the city's uh, invasive species and mm. nuisance plant list. It's pretty old. Mm. Okay. It's so old that we no longer really, re we, it's not that we don't refer to it. It is on our website. It's a reference, you know, the plants that are on it are definitely still considered invasive. It's just, there are so many others now. Right. Um, and uh, so that's an update. We should we write that in? Yeah, we mm -hmm. should. Can we just piggyback on Portland's Bureau of Environmental Services, whatever they have? 
Well, yeah. what we did was updated the definition of invasive plants to make reference to regionally accepted plant lists mm -hmm. in addition to the city's nuisance plant list. So, you know, maybe, maybe we're update. good. I don't know. It'd be good to update ours because, mm -hmm. you know, I'm pretty sure Italian Aram's not on that and that's thick as thieves in my neighborhood. People's yep. flower gardens are full of it. I'm just like, oh. <laughs> and that one's poisonous to dogs. I'll look out for that one. Which one was yeah. that? Italian what? Arum. A-R-U-M. It's called Lords and Ladies is one of its yeah. common names. And it's just pretty plant. It's got pretty leaves. It gets these orange berries in the fall. So it's a really attractive plant. And it's spread by birds because they eat those orange berries and then they poop everywhere. And then it is impossible to get rid of. If you try to dig it up, if you leave a little piece of really skinny root this big, it'll turn into a tuber and a whole new plant. Oh, no. I tried to dig a clump out of my yard and I just spread it everywhere. So it's, yeah, I, I've got it. I continually go around and take the leaves off and I still, I'm going to be doing it for the rest of my life. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> one of the, one of the guys right. I'm working with on, in McMinnville, who's clearing his property on the creek, he's got it on his property. And he dug it and then he realized like a week later after rains that the little roots that he had left were turning into tubers. He took a propane torch out. He's going to see if that works. Oh, <laughs> Great. 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 Yeah, it's always a bad one. Grandfather's approach, use motor oil. Kills yeah, that's, that's yeah, the old Oregon way. Right? Gasoline yeah. and motor oil, yep. Yeah. Somebody told me pour boiling water on it. You take your tea kettle out and pour boiling water on it. But... Yeah. Yeah, no, we have a, there was a, there is a few properties that have that lesser celandine, celandine mm -hmm. water, mm -hmm. and, you know, which spreads in the wet part, wet, cold part of the year and comes up in the spring, which is a major issue. Yeah. Okay. Garlic mustard, if we get a garlic mustard outbreak. Oh, oh Lordy. Yeah. <laughs> well, Pete, you got a number of botany geeks here on your committee, so it'd be yeah. fun. Let's do that one. You well, move that one that. up? Yep. I think that's more reasonable yeah. to put that one up here rather than, oop, hang on, put that one above the. Yeah, we can do that one. <laughs> what did yeah. I just do? There we go. Cut. And insert. Merge. There we go. Yay. Uh, Glad you're doing it, not me. <laughs> I don't know. There's probably a better format for this entire sheet, but <laughs> we'll have uh, NRC number th responsibility number three. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that one still. Receive notice and comment on land use applications and projects. Uh, review and comment on requests to reduce in-rod vegetation. Well, yeah, this was something that, that came up because of the request about the Kanema wetland, which was not on the NROD map. Right. And it wasn't yeah. touching the NROD map, so therefore we couldn't regulate it under the code. Um, but then we did adopt it into this NROD overlay, and then there was a push to reduce the vegetative corridor width. So a lot of history on that one. It was an unusual thing. I don't think it would typically come along if in a routinely in any kind of context other than the, the way it was presented previously it's kind of tied want to leave it on there i mean oh i'm not saying yeah. we should well it's very specific it's kind yeah. of like only these very little situations where somebody requests to do an enrod i mean any enrod application that's type two or higher you guys are going to be provided a, a notice of um just as we would provide notice to the citizen involvement committee or, or the neighborhood associations as well. Um, we send everything to you, not just NROD applications, but um, I think what's missing from this is that there's also the Willamette River Greenway mm. and there's also the geologic hazard over and for the NROD and the geologic hazard overlay actually match up significantly within the city limit. You know, they're very, oftentimes one and the same with a deviation of only a few 
you know, only 20, 30 feet here or there. So we could add those. Yeah. Um, let me say natural resource overlay. So review and come on a request to, I think this really ought to say vary from the standards okay. of mm -hmm. the natural resource overlay district. Yeah, rather than reduce, that's uh, um, pretty narrow. Like you guys commented on the uh, Forest Ridge Apartments stabilization project, you know that was a geologic geologic hazard overlay application. It did have an NROD application associated with it, but it was to confirm the boundary. Anyway, sorry. District and Willamette River. Anyway. Yeah, that's that's better. Okay. Anything else on this? I don't think so. Number four, conduct orderly meetings that result in good communications. <laughs> okay. These meetings are way too rowdy, Nancy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was just about to tell you to shut up, Mike. <laughs> Settle down. Maintain and update a list of NRC priorities and activities to share with the Planning Commission and City Commission. Oh, look. I know what we're doing now, right now. <laughs> oh, look at that. <laughs> Number five, coordinate with Parks and Rec and Planning and City Commission on at least an annual basis to result in good communication and mutually beneficial results. All right. Um, so as some of you know, Kendall Reed, our new Parks and Recreation Director, you know, he has a very small staff and a huge backlog of maintenance on all city parks. Some of in the vicinity of eleven million dollars backlog maintenance, which is staggering, uh, which makes it very difficult to focus and prioritize improvements, especially new parks. But they still manage to do that because we get at system development charges with new development, and we can only spend that money on new facilities. You can't spend system development charges on maintenance. Uh, which is good. So I think that's that's how uh, Filbert Run and Glen Oak Park got built. It's mostly STC money from new development, and those are considered wouldn't call them regional parks, but they're big enough to be considered neighborhood level parks, you know. And uh, so that's good. Okay. Question for you. Yeah. Um, is there a parks levy that I'm not? paying attention to not locally not city um there's a you know there's the metro construction excise tax for open space purchase by metro and a lot of that benefits oregon city because uh, things like kanima bluff open space and newell creek canyon open space which metro has acquired over the years um so you know we're metro city we're subject to metro standards but you know, the open space side of things is something that really benefits the city, I think, because um, they have such deeper pockets and they can leverage and negotiate directly with, uh, with property owners. Um, but local levy, I haven't heard of. It would be a good question. It would be something we could discuss with Kendall. Mike, you had a question? No, no, I was just scratching my head. <laughs> Could we invite him to one of the meetings coming yeah, up? That might be I think it'd be great. Let's invite yeah. Kendall. Yeah. yeah. I haven't met him and I, I just like to hear his perspective. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
and yeah, he would he would probably love idea. to meet you all yeah yeah Maybe i would think a, a yeah. local levy would be needed i mean for even for grants um so i mean i'm not adverse to talking about it learning about it seeing what options are um you know interested for at the parks staff level but i mean yeah 11 million is too much to do um alone and um yeah and sdcs aren't gonna work so and then again once you have the new park you know you're just getting more maintenance eventually down the road so there has to be some you know way to make parks uh work right i mean and i think his background he's coming from um springfield oregon which he was part of a recreation district that was kind of not city it was larger than that um you know like north clackamas recreation district we're not part of but there's potentially economies of scale associated yeah, with i used doing to work for ncprd you did so, okay yeah. sorry so i did a lot of their planning and um and planning revolving around their failed park levy that they tried uh, to do a couple years back and the whole you know happy valley you know uh, leaving the district and then the district kind of you know considering other municipal partners so okay it wouldn't be crazy to consider ncprd um as you know um because i think they're even they don't even include Gladstone either. Mm, so mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but I think it would be a little island of the district, which would be a little weird, but. Um, <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I have no idea how, how that's city. done. You know, I just kind of. <laughs> it's an MOU. Okay. It's not, um, you know, I mean, it's, it's a lengthy MOU <laughs> and it details all the uh, parks that the district is responsible for maintaining but they did have a, you know, chunk of money that pays. So SDCs goes into it a certain percentage, and then um, there's a levy that the district provides, and that was, oh, okay. if I remember right, I think it was like thirty-two cents, you know, point three two, which, huh. when they did the analysis for the entire state, was the lowest in the state. So they yeah. were asking to do a 10 cent raise, which would make it middle of is the that, state average. Samantha, is that in property tax? Or? Yeah, property taxes. So go ahead. The 10 cents was against property tax per, okay. Yeah, it was a assessed value. Yeah. Yeah. Does that makes sense. So yeah, I, I have experience with NCPRD and park districts and you know how they did it so, um, but it's definitely a partnership, a relationship, and it's it's not a you know something that is no cost and easy. Okay. Yeah, looks good. Yeah, nice work. <laughs> Outstanding. I'm going to, does anybody have any other activity suggestions they would like to float? We have to do this in 10 more meetings. <laughs> Should I hold on to mine until next year? Well, we don't, we can, we decide whether we want to adopt this tonight or table it. I almost think it might be good to let everybody read it over, you know, before the next meeting. And, you know, I, I like what's on it, but somebody might have an idea or want to reward something yep. to be a little bit more inclusive. We sure. don't have to go through the whole thing just if somebody has something it, they want to change at the next meeting, then we could add things or move things around a little bit. It's, yeah, okay. I will send this out to you. Okay. Great. You're going to send it to all of us, Pete? Yeah. 
Okay. Great. Oh, could I get like some that. guidance about what boundaries to set? Because I'm, I might yeah, have a big idea. So. so we used to have a lot of, I used to have a lot of guidelines on this. <laughs> I was like, you shouldn't be putting activities on here that really we can't accomplish within 2021, 2023 biennium unless they are an ongoing activity. Um, so, um, you know, there's probably, you know, some additional questions we could ask to ask, you know, is there any current funding for this project? Yes, no. Does this project have city commission support? Yes, no. Does, it, does this project have community support? Yes, no. You know, that, those are the kind of very general sideboards that I would ask. Um, and, I, and, and the other thing that we used to do, which we probably should still do, and I reference it in the top of the sheet here, is that you should kind of look at it with a view towards what the city commission goals and priorities are as well. So um, they may not deal with this at all, uh, which is the thing, you know, there may not be, there may be other priorities that it doesn't fit with. So what that tells you is that you should only choose projects that the NRC can really handle, or we can handle with grants. And if we're gonna go after grants, that's, we need to add that level of specificity to the activity. And by the time we start drilling down into details like that, and then we'll start to realize how much work is involved. Um, so that's kind of advice I would add between now and when we next discuss this. But it's a working document. It's got a big draft on it, as you can see. <laughs> and some of these things, about... some of these things have yeah. been on for years, so. Right. You know, and we haven't touched them like the the con trail connectivity type thing. Mm -hmm. So, I would have a question about like developing partnerships with you know aligned agencies like um, like the Oregon Heritage Tree Council. Mm -hmm. um, you know, is a volunteer council, um, and or my, you know, Oregon Community Trees is a volunteer council. Um, and there's similar and other um, types of groups. I remember I got an email asking about a liaison to the Greater Oregon City Watershed Council. Mm -hmm. So, you know, is oh. that kind of captured here in this document? Somewhat, um, you know, we, we talk about we've got some funny language here because I think at the time when number eight was discussed, there was actually a funding available for um, Cove projects. And so it's been morphed anyway. I think, um, yeah, um, support partnerships with those entities. Mm -hmm. And we can add that under eight. This one's really directed towards watersheds. So if we're talking about more urban forestry focus, we could add that as a new one. And I'm totally open to that. It's kind of we. There we go. And I guess one question would be like, how much representation would this liaison have for the city? I know we're appointed, but like, could a person from this board or from this group represent Oregon City at these um, uh, group meetings? And maybe they wouldn't be a voting member, um, but they could advise, they could give the perspective of the municipality. Um, um, boy, I don't know. I honestly don't. I, it's not, I'm not trying to duck that question. I just don't know. Um, it depends on how familiar you are with city policies, I suppose. Um, uh, but before we go there, so what was the, what was the name of the uh, organization? So there's Oregon Heritage Tree Council for the state. Yeah, okay. Board. 
and then uh, so that's one and then there's Oregon community trees mm -hmm. which is another state and that's an advice these are both advisory boards as well um, so OHT advises the Oregon Travel Information Council which mm -hmm. is a part of ODOT mm -hmm. and they manage uh, the rest stops and whatnot and also the Oregon Heritage Tree dedications and then there's Oregon Community Trees, which advises the Oregon, Oregon Department of Forestry's Urban and Community Forestry Assistance Program. Right. So these are both state advisory councils that Both. are entirely voluntary, uh, you know, supported. Um, yeah, I don't have, I don't see any problems with there being a liaison from the NRC that would, you know, go to these entities and, and, uh, you know, advocate for the city. I, um, I don't see a problem there as long as you're coordinating with staff, you know, that sort of thing. Right. And they would have to be uh, supported by the city, of course. Yeah. Well, I think Oregon Community Trees has helped us out more than once on uh, through the uh, Tree City USA program um, and on growth awards for Tree City USA been a while because they were they had a 500 hundred dollar grant but they didn't want to you know repeat that grant for this community if it did it the previous year but i hear oc got a growth award is that true you did um That's what I heard. not this year i don't know i i just if we did i someone filed that be other than me um i'll forward I, you the article i got Okay, please do. Because <laughs> I didn't apply for the growth award. I was wondering when they were going to come back and, and ask me about that. Because we <laughs> certainly qualify. I'll send you what I got. Yeah, I know we got the award for the, you know, the yearly award for the recognition, but not the growth award. Cool. Do you know what it said? It was a part of LeGrand's. Uh, it was a press release out of LeGrand. And mm -hmm. um it was a press release talking about LeGrand, but they highlighted that LeGrand got a growth award along with, you know. Yeah. Okay. OC was one of the other names. So it was oh, okay. not, it was within the second paragraph, I think. Yeah. I mean, I think we would have qualified through the adoption of the tree removal policy for city land. That's a new policy that would qualify for a growth award. So um, maybe I'll go back and hammer away at them. All right, it's 7.53, coming up on eight. We wanted to discuss Heritage Tree Advocate yeah. Award. Right. So um, when I clicked on that link, Nancy, it took me yeah. to the two-page application form that the state yeah, has. Uh, Sam sent me the, the on, like the, the, I'm so I'm getting so tired I can't think anymore. Yeah. Um, the the online application to fill out, but the question is is I really want to nominate Didi for a Heritage Tree Award. I mean, we wouldn't have virtually any heritage trees without her. We would never have rewritten the code. When I started on on this committee, she was on it too, um, and hammered heritage trees continually. Um, and then she got off the committee, but about the time she was getting off was when we actually started, well, let's rewrite the dang city code. And so she and I sat down, we went, we met for lunch one day and just sat there and I looked up what Portland did for their heritage tree code. And the whole idea was we originally, you had to have an arborist report for every tree that was nominated for heritage tree. And if you're a private homeowner, you can't afford that. That's really expensive. So we wanted to remove that. So we looked at what Portland did. And, and so we rewrote the code and we wrote what we wanted in their words wise. And then Pete put all the codes in. So it became legal, you know? <laughs> so the three of us hammered that out, but it would never- All the shells become... in and the maze. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, the, and the actual code numbers that, you know, I just, Oh. It's that other law, whatever that thing is, you know. So, um, but it would never have gotten done without Didi. She pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed. 
And then she's still pushing to nominate heritage trees. She's yeah. like our heritage tree guru. I mean, she she's really is. So, yeah, huh? she, she is unstoppable. Yeah. She is like what what was it Devin said? I wish I had her energy. I mean, literally, she's like it's like a, she's like ADHD or something. I, mean, I don't know, but she's got more energy than than adults are supposed to have, you know. <laughs> but uh, force of nature. I had a good friend that was like that too. But we call that forces of nature. Yes. Yeah, yes. forces of nature. Yeah, I wish I had that much energy. I really do. That's, absolutely. But, but I, you know, I'm willing to nominate her by myself, but at some point I started wondering if whether maybe the committee should nominate her because really it's, she's an asset to, asset to the whole community, not just to us, you know, to me personally. So, but I didn't want to do that without support from the committee. Um, I feel like it's more meaningful from the it committee. Mattered. Hmm? Uh, sorry to interrupt you. I, I was just gonna say, I think it's more meaningful from the, the committee altogether I think that that would mean a lot to her just from my limited experience with her I think it's a really good idea and I know she's been feeling really bad lately because she keeps because she is such a football she shows up at meetings and she talks and talks and talks and talks and I see people rolling their eyes and <laughs> and uh you know but but uh but yeah she's just I think she deserves it and I think it would really mean a lot to her to actually be honored for what she loves so much and what she's been doing because at one point she's like, I'm not going to do this anymore. People won't want to listen to me. And like, oh, Dee Dee, stop it. We all want to listen to you. So, but, so if, if I don't know whether we have a vote, whether everybody wants their name on it, I'll write it up and send it to you guys. Or do I have to send it to Pete who sends it out? Um, kind of new territory for me. So um, I think there's that form. And then, you know, if it requires letters of support from me, I'm happy to write one. Yeah. It um, what's on here. it needs so there's all and then the nomination narrative attach the nomination narrative and any supporting material about the nominee or group so probably a letter from you would be you know really good um sure maybe, maybe somebody from prac would want to write a letter too i don't know i don't is know how doug, well they're doing is, is doug, doug still on prac i don't know i, I thought he no he's not no. Okay. Mm. We've got uh, till the last Friday in April to get this in. So it's not like we have to rush and do this, but I could write up the nomination narrative. You know, and part of the thing is um, approximate time frame of activities and project. And so I'm going to have to go start digging back. And I know she started doing heritage trees long before I came on this board. Mm -hmm. um, so I may have to get some information from Pete, who's been dealing with her for longer than I have. Maybe Doug. Doug would yeah. Not. Yeah, for Didi, she's been incredibly patient considering the energy that she has. <laughs> it's sort of like- Boy, But the minute we got that law passed, that, this, yeah, the minute like, that law okay. got passed, she was like, trees, trees, trees. I know. <laughs> was she pestering Doug back when he was mayor to do tree stuff? Mm -hmm. okay. I wouldn't be surprised. Sure, yeah. Because didn't he start this committee under his mayoral yes. period of time? I, I yeah. Think so. Yeah. And and he had a you know he had at least one heritage tree. And I don't even know if he still lives in that house and the tree blew down or something. But I mean there's this whole story about some tree he had for a while that she pushed him to nominate. So you, you know, if you look back at the original resolution creating the NRC, I could be wrong. I, I know Doug was hugely part of it, but Mayor Alice Norris, I think, is the one who was someone signed the mm -hmm. resolution. Okay. Yeah. Uh, back in the day, right? You know, yeah. but I bet edie has been involved through that whole time frame, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, when I got on 2006 through 2009, when I was very green and not very good at communicating with people, um, and the the NRC kind of bumbled along, and Dee Dee wasn't involved in it then. Okay that I was aware of. Um, then there was a sort of a hiatus uh, and then it was reinvigorated in 2011, um, which is when uh, you all came on board and, and we really pushed to have a, a stronger voice at City Hall. And I think it became better, you know, because of the work that Doug was doing. And, and then 
Dee Dee got on the committee and that's when the heritage tree program really took off because yeah. it was one of the, one of the bylaws was to adopt. We had a code, but we didn't have a process. So, um, you know, it wasn't clear what you were supposed to do. Maybe I'll talk, talk to Doug. That Doug would have a lot more information about maybe yeah. when everything started and. I'll, yeah, I'll, sure. I'll do what I can and, you know, fill in, get some of Doug's info. Yeah, I just need to get that early history I can talk about from when I came on the committee, which I still can't remember what year it was, but I think I have 2016. Okay. It's my first stuff I have, but that doesn't mean I don't have other agendas that I didn't stick somewhere else. So <laughs> I have no idea, but but I will, I'll get a hold of Doug and I'll write up just a general narrative and send that out and see if people want to add and subtract from it and we'll get Pete to write a letter. And so, but I'll get working on that soon because otherwise it'll get shoved under my pile of school things to do. And so once I get the fish DNA lab written, oh, it's next week. <laughs> yes. We're going to do DNA barcoding with fish. I have to go to a fish store and get different types of fish. And then the students are going to extract DNA and do PCR and run gel electrophoresis. And then we send these samples off to the, a lab and they tell us exactly what species of fish they are. Wow. And apparently the whole thing started with a group of students in New York who got suspicious about what fish they were telling them was in their sushi. And so they <laughs> got samples and they sent them all off to some lab and found out that 17% of the fish in the sushi wasn't what they said it was. And so there was, they wrote a paper, they got a paper published, it's called Sushi Gate. <laughs> so, <laughs> Good DNA. So they're doing that lab, it's gonna be fun. <laughs> but yeah, okay, so I will take, I will, I will get something written up before the next meeting, I'll send something to you and I'll talk to Doug so I can get better history. But yeah, okay. Great. Sounds thank like you, thank folks you. are all agreed on that. Yeah. Okay. If you don't want your name on, just let me know. <laughs> um, um, anything else? All right. I, I honestly don't have a lot of communications. Um, the OC2040 project is, we you know, sort of back on track. We had a fourth project advisory team meeting. Chris was there. Mm -hmm. Thanks for Thanks for being there. Several of us met a couple. Yeah, several of us met with Chris on Sunday. Yeah, over the weekend. Just a couple of days. Just kidding. Now. Awesome. Yeah. Yep. Have a yep. little yep. community conversation. That's right, and that even led, uh, thanks to Carrie, to a, a second one in the works. Right on. uh, Going to try to slip that in before the the deadline on the fifteenth. Cool. A deadline. This hard and fast deadline that we set. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that um, was so a great conversation and uh, good. Yeah, great introduction to the new members. I enjoyed are, it. Are really. you wanting to just send me written notes, or do you want to punch them into the OC uh, the survey? Because you can do it either way. I have written notes. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I'll send them to you. Okay. Um, that's about it, guys. It's about Thimble yeah. Creek on there, but I don't think there's anything to update on Thimble Creek, is there? I think we said everything that basically where we're at in our holding pattern now. Yeah. And Pete, you were going to reach out to them, I guess, and see where they're at. Yeah. Offer, offer our assistance again if they need it. Yeah, I will do that. Yeah. Uh, how about you all? Do you have any questions or reports for me? And then we need to discuss if there's anything that we want to put on the agenda that's pressing for next month, but. Um, Nothing pressing, but I'd love to get the new parks director on there. Yeah. Who's not that new anymore, but you know. Yeah. One He's... announcement when you're ready. Sure. Um, yeah. So another mention of Oregon Community Trees uh, award nominations for an individual or organization that should be recognized in urban and community forestry is due on the 15th, which is next Monday. And um, I shared that stuff with Pete a while ago. I don't know if I need to refresh. I'm happy to- You need it. to refresh me, sorry. <laughs> no worries. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's just, um, it's on our OCT website is the easiest way to get there. So yeah. um, 
but yeah, I can send that back to Pete, but yeah, um, it could be an arborist, it could be an organization, it could be your neighbor next door who encourages people to do good care and advocacy for their urban and community forest. It doesn't have to be urban, it can be rural. So um, mm -hmm. like Hopkins is a good example. Um, I think they've already gotten an award, so. Um, but send then the nominations is all I'm asking. It just occurred to me, I think we skipped over something in the work plan, um, which had to do about um, reuse of urban wood. Mm. Um, and I think it, it's tied to the adopted policy of city, you know, city tree removal policy, but what hasn't really been fleshed out is what to do with any wood that comes out of that, particularly if it's good quality. Um, and public works guys are like, well, we'll just lay it over here. But there needs to be some guidance from, I think, the committee about that. So that would be a good idea th item for next agenda, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I did uh, attend, uh, Samantha, I think the, those are both of your recommendations, uh, the Urban Forest Meeting and um, also the Tree City USA that started today too. So um, I did take some notes on- well, That was today? Okay. That was. So right. I'd like to hear your notes. Um, I didn't go to the, US, the Tree City USA one. Um, so I'd like to hear your notes on that. Um, yeah, but particularly real quick, just on the, the tree inventory, because I know you're spearheading, or, you know, uh, that up. Um, they did have the city of Bozeman, Montana has a pretty robust tree inventory report. And I think they have a lot on their website. So if you want oh, to cool. check them out. Yeah, they, it was, I was pretty impressed with their presentation today. Mm. That might give us some guidance there. And uh, Carrie also volunteered to be uh, liaison to Greater Oregon City Watershed Council. Great, thank you. Uh, thanks, Carrie. Did you? Is that right? <laughs> yeah, I, I said I had an interest <laughs> in it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Okay. Can't you know, I, I, uh, I wanted to learn. I, I'm still trying to figure out what the, the big picture is or what exactly is a liaison. You know, I'm yeah, sure, all sure. this. So I did listen in on their meeting. Um, uh, I did attend last night. So um, uh, I, I guess I need a little bit more understanding. And I don't know if I can commit with the time wise of. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, what do you, I guess, what are you guys looking for me from that or? I don't think it's more than just coming back to the committee and telling us about what, what they're up to, Okay. Uh, you know, okay. Um, and then, you know, if there are projects that we need to act on that need support, then okay. we just have a better line of communication. Yeah. Well, I took some great notes. So if you want me to report on that next time, you know, or what they're doing, I'm happy to do that. Um, Awesome. I just don't know if I can make their meeting on an every monthly basis. So. Well, I'm not sure they meet on every month basis either. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and apparently they are looking for a paid uh, coordinator position yeah. or CEO. Yeah. yeah. They are. They're looking for um, an executive director position. So um, yeah. I think they've got some uh, a posting on a couple of boards right now, but if in, I think their deadline was February 28th for that. So if anybody knows a good candidate, um, please, you know, help them out with that respect. Yeah. So. Did they turn it into a full-time paid position? Because I know it was part-time. I believe, and I'm just trying to go off memory from having a look at the requirements. I think it's a 30 hours a week um, position, but I could be wrong on that. I'm just trying to to go off memory of what it was. So, I think if you raise enough money, it becomes more full time. Um, one of my good friends is the executive director of the Greater Yamhill Watershed Council because we work with him on all the projects we're doing in McMinnville. And his started out half time, and he's pretty much full time. But it's him working to find more funding all over the place. So, huh? 
those are challenging kinds of jobs. Yeah, yeah. but he's been doing it. I mean, before it'd be like a person for a year or maybe two years, and he's been it for like the past six or seven years. Yeah. He's also from McMinnville. In fact, his his ancestors actually were the first people who owned the property Linfield College is on. So <laughs> he goes way back. He's fun to talk to, but but yeah. So but he actually posted that job, and so I posted it on. We've got a Linfield has an environmental studies web. Facebook page and I posted it on there. I have a lot of students and alumni who continually check that for jobs and internships. And so it's a good place. If you have any jobs, let me know and I can post it on there. So are we good? I'm good. Yeah. Anybody else have anything for the greater good? The good of the order, as Doug Neely used to say. Yeah, it was something like that. What did Doug used to say? <laughs> um, well, thanks for your participation, guys. And I know you guys are all busy and working on other things. So uh, keep me in the loop and uh, keep sending me questions. I'll try to be as responsive as I can. Okay, hey, this meeting cool. is adjourned. I will see you all in a month, except I'll see Mike walking up and down the street. <laughs> <laughs> see you guys. All right. Bye. I see Chris, too. I see Chris in Waterburn Park, too. So. <laughs> oh, okay, cool. <laughs> yeah, hey, guys. Guys. All right, good night. Good night. Good night. I put that in the text the link. I see that. Links. I've got that. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Yep. Okay. All right. Good night, everybody. Night. Good night. Okay, where's the leave button? <laughs> <laughs> I got to click out before you do. Oh, okay. No, you don't. You can leave. It. <laughs> no, I can leave. You're the coast. We, we could chat all night.